Good afternoon. This is going to be a relatively brief, brief video cast addressing anesthesia for cesarean delivery in preparation for our upcoming flip classroom or PBL session. Um, we will go into much greater detail and discuss anesthesia for cesarean and some challenging clinical scenarios during our um, Zoom conference in a few days. So to begin, let's talk about preoperative preparation um, for a patient undergoing cesarean delivery. When we see these patients on our patient history, there are certain things that we want to focus on, um, in particular that will guide us in terms of our plans for anesthetic management. Number one, we want to determine what, if any, obstetric complications this woman has encountered. Uh, does she have a placenta previa? Are they suspecting an abruption? Does she have preeclampsia? All of these um, obstetric complications will affect how we manage our anesthetic. Um, secondly, what about other medical conditions that are pre-existing comorbidities such as cardiac disease, asthma, neurologic conditions, and not only are those comorbidities present, but how has the pregnancy affected the patient? Has her asthma gotten worse? Has it gotten better? Things like that. That's important information to acquire as we um, see the patient and start to develop an anesthetic plan. Obviously, it's extremely important to um, obtain information about previous anesthesia history, uh, we all know difficult airway, whatever. Um, and in these OB patients, where many of these patients will ultimately have a neuraxial anesthetic, it's important to find out if they've had previous neuraxial procedures, and if so, how did those go? Was, was placement difficult? Did the, the block work? Was it one-sided, et cetera? That's important information. And then another piece of information that I think will help you in terms of planning your management, both, both intraoperatively and postoperatively, is to determine whether or not this patient has a um, history of um, substance use. Once you've obtained that history, then you want to go on to your physical exam. And there are, are four areas that are particularly important to focus on in the patient who you're planning an anesthetic for cesarean delivery. Um, and to document. One, of course, is the airway. As we know um, from our physiologic changes lecture, there is a higher risk of difficult intubation in parturients due to airway edema and other physiologic changes. So it's key, even in the most emergent situation, that you take time to quickly assess the airway and determine whether or not you anticipate difficulty with intubation. Obviously, cardiopulmonary condition is important um, to assess before providing anesthesia. And then, especially in those patients in whom you plan a, a neuraxial anesthetic, I think it's very important to take a look at their back. Don't um, be surprised when you take her back to the operating room and find out she has very significant scoliosis. Or if she's morbidly obese, can you or can you not um, palpate landmarks and should you be considering using the ultrasound if, if, there, if you do anticipate difficulty. And then finally, I think it's important to do um, a, a focused neurologic examination before doing any neuraxial anesthetic to see if there are any pre-existing neurologic deficits that you would want to document before going ahead and doing a neuraxial procedure. Now, once you've finished your history and physical, let's move on to are there any sort of preoperative medications that we want to, to administer? Well, um, as we've talked previously when we talked about physiologic changes of pregnancy, the pregnant patient is generally considered at higher risk for, for aspiration. And so I believe, and I think most obstetric anesthesiologists would say that administration of an, a non-particular antacid, specifically by Citra, really should be mandatory in these patients who are going to the operating room for cesarean delivery. And many of us also like to administer other medications for um, aspiration prophylaxis including an H2 blocker, metoclopramide, and um, also to help with intraoperative nausea and vomiting and postoperative nausea and vomiting, also seriously consider the administration of a 5-HT3 antagonist such as Andansetron. Um, next, what about fluid management, especially in that patient where you may be planning a neuraxial anesthetic and will have a significant sympathetic block? We generally do do some fluid loading. One thing to, to note is that there's some evidence to suggest that co-loading is more effective in terms of helping prevent 
hypotension related to neuraxial anesthesia versus fluid preloading. So to me, I don't think it's important to have a big bolus in before the patient goes to the operating room. But on the other hand, I do like to um, open up the IV and get a good co-load of, of IV fluid in as I'm doing my neuraxial anesthetic. So now that we've done our preoperative preparation, we need to plan our anesthetic for cesarean delivery. And the first thing we need to decide is, are we going to do a regional neuraxial anesthetic or a general anesthetic? So um, regional anesthesia is going to be preferred in most cases. As we know, as I have already mentioned, the pregnant patient is considered to be at increased risk for aspiration as well as difficult intubation. So for these reasons, um, we feel it's generally safer to do a neuraxial anesthetic. In addition, um, you know, cesarean delivery, this is a very important time in the life of a woman and her family. And um, I think we, we have an obligation to do our best to provide them the best experience that they can have. And that includes usually allowing the mother to be awake and to have a partner present for delivery. And so these are all things that we can offer with a regional anesthetic that we're not able to offer if we do a general anesthetic. That being said, there will be times when we have to do general anesthesia for cesarean delivery. Uh, the most common time is when we have an emergency section due to sustained fetal bradycardia primarily. Baby's heart rate is down um, and is not coming back up. The patient does not have an epidural catheter in place. Um, obviously, the baby is, is not in a good condition, and the obstetrician wants to get that baby delivered as quickly as possible, and we all know that a a general anesthetic um, can accomplish anesthesia for surgery more quickly than doing a neuraxial technique. You also will encounter some patients that may have some sort of a coagulopathy, um, for instance, HELP syndrome, or also, especially now that our obstetricians are utilizing more um, thromboembolism, thromboembolism prophylaxis, you're more likely to encounter patients who may have um, recently been on anticoagulant medications, which may um, prevent the use of neuraxial anesthesia. Occasionally, you have the septic patient who you would want to not want to be doing a neuraxial anesthetic. And then finally, you do um, run into some patients who simply refuse to have a regional anesthetic. And clearly, you cannot force anyone to have an epidural or spinal anesthetic, and you would, in that situation, also um, require general anesthesia. Now, let's talk about neuraxial anesthesia first, though, because that's what the majority of our patients are going to receive. Um, in terms of neuraxia, though, there's lots of options. There's epidural anesthesia. There's single shot spinal, combined spinal epidural. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, the situations where you might preferably use each of these. So I think it probably goes without saying that if you have a patient with an epidural catheter in place for labor, and now the decision is made that this patient needs a cesarean delivery, that um, you're going to go ahead and use that epidural catheter as long as it's been working um, adequately throughout labor. In addition to that, there are other situations where the patient may present to you for cesarean delivery. Um, a scheduled cesarean delivery does not yet have an epidural in place because she's not been laboring. Um, but an epidural anesthetic might be the preferred technique. And that would be situations such as you anticipate a long surgery. Say this is a patient with a BMI of 50, and this is going to be her fourth cesarean delivery. You know that's going to be a long surgery. If you do an epidural anesthetic, you dose your epidural catheter from the start and um, you get an adequate block, you're pretty reassured that you will be able to redose that epidural and continue to provide adequate anesthesia for however long the surgery takes. Um, I also like to use an epidural anesthetic in a patient where I anticipate a difficult airway. Again, for the reason that I feel confident that I will continue to be able to redose and maintain anesthesia. With a combined spinal epidural, I do have an epidural catheter in place, but I don't know 100% that that catheter is going to work until I've actually dosed it. And the nice thing about the epidural is that I have established that I have an adequate level before I let the surgeon start surgery and I already feel comfortable that it's a functioning catheter. Whereas with a CSC, I won't know that it's functioning until I go to dose it after my spinal has started to wear off. Now, other situations where you might consider doing an epidural rather than a spinal or a combined spinal epidural are situations where it would be beneficial to the mother and or the baby to slowly raise your level and see how the patient is going to tolerate the sympathectomy that's um, 
that is being developed as you uh, raise your level up. So this might be the patient with serious cardiac disease, say someone with aortic stenosis who is not going to tolerate a rapid and big drop in SVR. Another situation might be where you have compromised uterine placental perfusion and the fetus has shown that they don't tolerate any, any drops in blood pressure. You can more slowly raise the, the level and avoid any significant hypotension with slow dosing and epidural versus, say, doing a single shot spinal where you will um, quickly develop a sympathetic block and potentially um, see drops in blood pressure that the baby may not tolerate. So if you're going to use an epidural, how do you dose that epidural for C-section? Well, to have adequate anesthesia, you're going to need at least a T6 sensory level bilaterally and preferably a level as high as T4 for the patient to be most comfortable. Um, most commonly, we use 2% lidocaine with epinephrine. Um, anywhere usually from 15 to 20 milliliters. And this will give you a nice dense block within usually 10 to 15 minutes. Now, in an emergency, that may not be fast enough. And so in a stat cesarean delivery situation, we frequently prefer to use 3% chlorprocaine um, for a variety of reasons. Number one, it has a quicker onset, so you can have adequate anesthesia more quickly if you have a baby that is in distress. Um, secondly, it does have a better safety profile. It is metabolized by plasma cholinesterase. So um, if, in fact, you inadvertently injected intravascularly, the drug is metabolized so quickly, you'd be much less likely if you'd given a large dose of intended epidural chlorprocaine versus another local anesthetic intravascularly to see local anesthetic toxicity on the, uh, for the mother. And then finally, if this is an emergent situation due to um, concerning fetal status, you can assume that this baby may have some component of fetal acidosis. And because chlorprocaine is metabolized so quickly, there's very little placental transfer of the drug. And as a result, you don't have the situation of what we call ion trapping. With a drug like lidocaine or bupivacaine, um, you do have significant placental transfer. The baby's now in an acidotic state. And so more of that local anesthetic will become ionized and then cannot cross back over to the maternal side. And you'll get fetal accumulation of local anesthetic. Now let's move on to talking about spinal or combined spinal epidural for cesarean delivery. Um, you will find that we do the majority of our scheduled cesarean deliveries with one of these techniques rather than with an epidural. Um, there are a few reasons. I think most importantly, you do get a superior anesthetic. You, you don't worry much about for instance, missed segments, you tend to get a denser block. Patients tend to be more comfortable with the pushing and pressure that, that um, occurs during a cesarean delivery with a spinal anesthetic as compared to an epidural anesthetic. Um, also, in terms of efficiency, it has a more rapid onset. Um, so, you know, you're going to have a block within two to three minutes rather than within 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, it takes long, so you have a shorter procedure time, and so that can make it ideal in urgent situations. Say the obstetricians are concerned about a tracing, but they say you have a few minutes to do, try to do an araxial, or, you know, the woman is nine centimeters and baby's breech, and so we need to move quickly, but we have a few minutes. A, a spinal, especially a single shot spinal, could be a good choice in that situation. Now, what are the disadvantages of a spinal or a combined spinal epidural? Well, compared to an epidural, you may see a higher incidence of hypotension. Um, however, uh, as we now routinely are using phenylephrine infusions, the risk of that um, is, is, is much less than when we did not use those phenylephrine infusions. That does quite a good job prophylactically of preventing hypotension. But if you do have hypotension, usually it can be very quickly treated so that it's in most cases, not going to be detrimental to, to the fetus or the mother. Um, I don't think that especially a single shot spinal is a good choice when you do anticipate long surgeries. I mentioned an epidural may be an ideal choice in that situation. Uh, with a single shot spinal, your duration is limited. Um, with the bupivacaine that we normally use, um, you know, you can probably count on an hour and a half. So if it's a two and a half hour surgery, you know, if you've done a single shot spinal and your block's wearing off, you have no choice but to now convert to general anesthesia, which we would prefer to avoid.
Um, a combined spinal epidural is a better choice than a spinal in a situation where you anticipate a long surgery because you do have that epidural catheter in place. And in the vast majority of cases, as the spinal starts to wear off, you can dose the epidural and you'll continue to have adequate anesthesia. However, occasionally something goes awry with the, the threading of that epidural catheter. And you may find out as your spinal is wearing off and you dose the epidural that it's not functioning appropriately. And then um, again, you might be forced to convert to general anesthesia anesthesia. Um, because of these potential problems, I also don't feel that either of these techniques is a really good choice in someone who has a, you're concerned about a possible difficult airway because again, I don't want to in the middle of surgery have to convert to general anesthesia in someone where I anticipate I might have difficulty. Now, if I'm going to do a spinal or a combined spinal epidural, how do I go about dosing it? Well, pretty much we use three quarters percent hyperbaric spinal bupivacaine is the most commonly used drug. I think it's probably the only spinal drug I've used for many years now. Um, there are a variety of ways to dose it. You'll find some of your attendings just say use all 15 milligrams, all two cc's of your spinal bupivacaine vial. That works. I personally like to tailor it to some point, the dosing to some extent to patient height with the goal of obtaining about a T4 level bilaterally. So anywhere from 10 to 15 milligrams of spinal bupivacaine is what I will use in most patients. We generally will add opioid that improves the quality of your spinal block. Um, Fentanyl 15 to 25 micrograms um, will help improve the quality of the block. And then for post-operative analgesia, if you're doing a spinal, you can give intrathecal morphine, most commonly used at a dose of 150 micrograms. And that will be used primarily for your post-operative analgesia. If you um, are doing a spinal or CSE in someone where you do anticipate it's going to be a somewhat longer surgery, so it's not a patient who's 80 kilos and it's her first C-section, rather it's someone who's 100 kilos and it's their second or third cesarean delivery, surgeries might take a bit longer. You, uh, I would also recommend that you add um, epinephrine to your um, spinal anesthetic dosing. Finally, though, as I mentioned, um, when we first got started, there are going to be situations where you do have to do a general anesthetic for cesarean delivery. Um, and so what are the things to consider there? Well, first of all, um, even in an emergent situation, it is mandatory that you assess that airway. You do not want to be put into a situation of you didn't look at the airway, you went and pushed induction drugs, now the patient's apneic and you go and look and realize, oh my goodness, she's got a very difficult airway, she's really anterior, whatever. So even in the most emergent situations, you need to take time to at least assess the airway and see, do I anticipate difficulty? Uh, these patients do, um, should have a rapid sequence induction as we do consider them at, at higher risk for aspiration, especially the patient maybe who has labored. Your induction agent is gonna be based on the patient status. So in the majority of patients, you're probably gonna use propofol as your induction agent. However, if you are doing an emergent C-section because someone is hemorrhaging due to a placental abruption, placenta previa, uh, propofol probably would not be your ideal um, induction agent and instead you would prefer to use an agent that is going to maintain hemodynamic stability better such as atomidate or ketamine. And then being a rapid sequence induction we generally will use succinylcholine anywhere from a dose of one to one and a half milligrams per kilo for our muscle relaxation. When you're doing a general anesthetic in a pituitary, it's always important to have in the back of your mind, and you should do this for every anesthetic, but especially in this patient population, where we realize that they may be at higher risk for a difficult intubation, is to have in the back of your mind that difficult airway algorithm. And if, if I do have a failed um, intubation, what am I going to do? Another thing you need to think about is, since these patients are at higher risk for difficult intubation, am I going to do a direct laryngoscopy or do I want to start out from the beginning um, using a glide scope? And that is a decision you can make um, with your attending um, with each patient. In terms of once you get the patient um, intubated and they're starting surgery, how are you going to maintain anesthesia? Generally, um, before delivery of the fetus, we will generally maintain anesthesia with one of our volatile agents, whatever one you prefer. There's really no benefit of one over the other, along with some nitrous oxide, usually at um, a concentration of 50% nitrous, 50% oxygen until the baby is delivered. 
Um, we generally, unless there's a maternal indication that you, it would be very beneficial to administer opioids before delivery of the infant, we usually try to avoid giving opioids until after the baby has been delivered. Now, after that baby has been delivered, though, now are we going to change our anesthetic? Yes, to some extent. Um, our volatile agents, be it isofluorine, desfluorine, civofluorine, they have an effect on uterine tone, and that is a dose-dependent effect. The, the, the higher the concentration of volatile agent, the more likely that your uterus will not contract down and you'll have a problem with uterine acne and postpartum hemorrhage related to that uterine acne. So generally, uh, once the baby is delivered, we'd like to come down on our concentration of volatile agent to about a half of MAC. Um, and then at that point, baby's delivered. Um, we can, first of all, as long as mom is oxygenating fine, we can increase our concentration of nitrous oxide. I will generally come up to as much as 70% nitrous oxide and also can begin administering opioid to the patient. And the majority of um, gen general anesthetics for cesarean delivery, you don't need to give additional muscle relaxant other than the succinylcholine that you used at the beginning. Um, there may be times, though, when um, the surgeons are having some sort of struggle with their surgery, and you may need to give a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant, and that's fine if you need to. Now, when it comes time to um, reverse, if you did give that non-depolarizing agent, um, Generally, I think, although a lot of people are using a lot of Sugamadex now, and many places are using that routinely in most of their general OR cases for um, reversal, it, there's still not a lot of data about its use um, at term and in, in, in lactating at term. And so the Society for Obstetric Anesthesia and Perinatology, in a statement they came out with last year, actually does not encourage the reversal of non depolarizing muscle relaxants with Sugamadex in the term patient undergoing cesarean delivery. Um, the main reason for that being that there's limited data about its effect on the initiation of breastfeeding in the infant, and so for that reason they recommend um, reversing with neostigmine and glycopyrrolate rather than using Sugamadex. I will note as an aside that there doesn't seem to be a problem for women who come back for some sort of surgery while they are, are lactating on um, patients who have established breastfeeding, there doesn't seem to be an issue from that standpoint. Um, finally, in terms of general anesthesia, it's important to know that in terms of airway issues, um, obstruction, aspiration, the data in terms of anesthesia-related maternal morbidity uh, shows that most of these problems no longer occur at induction, because we've gotten so good at that with so many different airway adjuncts, but rather more likely to occur at emergence and in the immediate post-operative period. So it's very important in this patient population that you make certain that the patient is awake and able to protect their airway before you um, extubate that patient. Now, what about postoperatively? What considerations do we have there? Well, one of our responsibilities as the anesthesiologist is to make sure that the patient um, receives good postoperative analgesia. This is an important component of um, enhanced recovery after cesarean. Uh, generally, we prefer to use neuraxial opioids over IV opioids. And the vast majority of patients in our practice and throughout the United States will receive the bulk of their postoperative cesarean analgesia via the use of epidural or spinal preservative-free morphine or duramorph. Um, it's considered kind of the gold standard in terms of post-cesarean analgesia. Uh, there are particular patients, though, who may be better served by a patient-controlled epidural analgesia technique. In our patient population, I would say specifically our patients with opioid use disorder, uh, the single dose of epidural morphine may be inadequate to provide analgesia to those patients. And the nice thing about PCA is that you can titrate that to whatever this particular patient's postoperative analgesia needs are. Now, in addition to the use of preservative free morphine, a very another important part of enhanced recovery after cesarean is the use of multimodal analgesia. So um, that would include both the use of NSAIDs and um, acetaminophen. And here at UK, our obstetricians do have standing round-the-clock orders for both Motrin, 
initially, I think they get one or two doses of Ketorolac, and then as they're taking PO, they get round-the-clock scheduled doses of Motrin and acetaminophen, um, and that works very well. Uh, you might ask, what about this is an abdominal surgery? It seems like tap blocks would be useful. Um, actually, there have been a fair number of studies looking at tap blocks um, in conjunction with preservative-free morphine, which, as I said, in most practices throughout the United States, pretty much everyone gets that. And those studies have shown that really um, you don't get any improved analgesia when you add tap blocks to patients who have already received epidural or spinal um, morphine. Um, however, there are patients where tap locks may be useful um, after cesarean delivery. One would be that patient who did not have an araxial technique. They had an emergent C-section under general anesthesia. Tap blocks could certainly be useful in those patients. And you also might consider, especially in those patients with opioid use disorder that are especially motivated, don't want to receive, want to minimize their use of opioids, you might consider adding tap blocks um, in those patients also. And then finally, um, DVT prophylaxis, as I mentioned earlier, is becoming more common in the obstetric patient being used on a regular basis in patients who have risk factors. And so we need to be aware of that and um, have communication with our obstetricians if they are planning on initiating DVT prophylaxis prophylaxis postoperatively, discussing with the, the timing of that as in comparison to when the epidural catheter was removed and making sure that we are following the guidelines, our national guidelines related to that.